and welcome to another episode of the Fully Charged Plus podcast. My name is Robert Llewellyn. Fully Charged show has been running for the last, getting on for 13 years, 12 years. Let's go with 12. Uh, and we focus on the exciting developments in the world of electric vehicles, renewable energy and sustainable technology, the circular economy. That's what we're all about. That's what this show is all about. And this show in particular is very much about that. Um, one of the great advantages we have of uh, in this uh, running this show, so there's, you know, I'm talking fully charged show on, on YouTube uh, and also this podcast is that we have been supported by some amazing companies. And in particular, I'm going to go straight in to thank our sponsor, our main sponsor, our headline sponsor, our only sponsor of this podcast, a company, My Energy, uh, who are based in the UK, who when we first met them, I think were four people, are now close to 400, and they make some brilliant products. And I, the reason I'm mentioning this now because it is still sunny outside here in the UK, and I'm using a thing called a Zappy Charger, which is made by My Energy. It's a little charging fella up on the wall of my garage, has a socket. I plug a wire in, plug the other end into my car. And at the moment, it is only using excess solar energy from my solar panels that's going into the car. What is the cost per kilowatt hour of that? It is zero, which is incredibly important in our current climate let's be honest uh because it's a, we're all in a very terrifying position in the uk for those of you outside the uk who don't quite know what's going on with our energy costs it is unimaginably horrendous it is going it, it, our costs are going up hundreds of percent i didn't even know this would ever be possible and something will obviously break and it, it will have to be sorted but it is truly terrifying so companies like my energy are really coming into their own because what they help you do is two things, save energy by using it carefully and at the right time, and also allow you to utilize the full benefit of having solar panels fitted to your house. Uh, and in my case, that you know our house runs pretty much 100% on solar for about eight months of the year. Uh, and we can charge our cars as well, so that we're very, very privileged in that sense. And that they make that a seamless, frictionless experience. And their technology has been proven. I can say this with confidence because I've had it for a long time. Very reliable, very solid. So the two key things are the Zappi and the Eddy. So the Zappi charges your car. The Eddy controls all the electricity that comes into your home, particularly from solar, and puts it in the right place. So the central heating uh, heat sink that I have there, thermal store. Not, I was going to say heat battery or heat sink. No, I'm calling it a thermal store. That's the official term. Then our Mixer G electric water tank. You know, I don't. I will turn it off because I think we don't need any hot water today. And there's a lot of excess solar. It heats that water anyway. What else are you going to do with it? May as well heat it. So then you come home and you go, oh, my God, there's loads of hot water. I'll have five showers just for the bants, as young people said about eight years ago. Uh, so my, uh, my energy brilliant company you can find out far more about what they're doing and they've got some very exciting products being launched very soon um, I have stated incorrectly <laughs> that my energy we're going to have a standard our fabulous show that's coming up very very shortly in uh, San Diego on the 10th and 11th of September they're not uh, some representatives of my energy will be attending uh, partially, I expect, for the bands, but also just to sound out the American market because they certainly could do, a, they, could, they could be, they're, they're amazing. People in America would love their products. Um, but you can find out more at myenergy.com, M-Y-E-N-E-R-G-I, myenergy, myenergy.com, uh, where you can find out all about all the products they do and everything they're doing and where they're, Exciting new products I'm not allowed to mention yet are going to be launched, but I'm very excited about that. They're an amazing place. Anyway, let's get on with this particular podcast because um, I want to introduce uh, this week's guest who is an absolutely charming man, and I will admit it now. I do mention this at the end. I was a bit late. Why? I don't know. I, I didn't plan it. I was basically, uh, I picked up my uh, my wife in London because she'd just come back. That, does that sound wrong? I picked up my wife. No, it sounds absolutely perfectly acceptable. We have been married for 35 years or something. 34, not going to exaggerate, 34 years. Um, we she just come back from Australia where a family uh, event, a very sad family event in Australia. 
she got off the plane first thing this morning and I picked her up and I was uh, driving her back. And of course, it's a lovely day in the UK today. It's unusual. We've got to have had a beautiful summer and it's a bank holiday. It's a public holiday. So we're driving, 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 very quiet roads until we get to the area we live in, which is a very popular area for tourists to come and on holiday makers to come, on, particularly on public holidays. And it was pandemonium. It was chaos for us to get through little villages where we'd normally go through without a second thought were just solid with traffic and everything so i was late mad rush to get here set up robert was a fantastically patient and kind man he didn't get upset he's in california i'm in gloucestershire um so the my guest today is robert barossa he is the um, i'm going to make sure i get the title right here he is the senior director of sales business development and marketing for electrify america llc Electrify America are doing amazing things. They really are. They have already put in 3,500 uh, rapid and ultra rapid charges at 800 sites. They're heading for, uh, I mean, tripling that in the next few years. They are doing incredibly, they are often on an average week, they will open four new charging sites, not four charges, four charging sites where there could be anything between five and 10 uh, ultra rapid chargers installed for a week across the United States. Very, very rapid uh, charging. They also do Electrify Canada, so they're putting in chargers right across Canada. You can now, even today, you can drive from one end of the country to the other using Electrify America charge points. Been a really interesting conversation. Really hope you enjoy listening to Robert. He's a very inspiring man with a, with a long, long history and knowledge of uh, how you charge electric cars. Uh, he, he, before he was at Electrify America, because I didn't talk about this when I was with him, uh, he, was the, uh, he, he worked in strategy and business development for EVGo, which is another charging uh, uh, network, and as an executive with Aerovironment Incorporated, which focused on the products and services, so the actual chargers themselves. But the stuff he says about finding out how chargers, how reliable they are, how many cars can charge on them, the interaction between the car and the charger, critically important stuff in making this system of charging electric cars when you're on the road absolutely frictionless critically important they're working on it really exciting please welcome to the fully charged plus podcast robert barossa robert thank you so much for for joining us on the the fully charged uh, podcast it's really really exciting because this is an area quite quite often i will talk to people on this show where i actually know quite a lot about the topic or the speciality that the person is working in, or at least I've got some experience of it, you know, yeah. in maybe some uh, technology in this country. I haven't got a clue <laughs> about what's happening in America with Electrify America, with the charging infrastructure, with everything that you're dealing with. So, I mean, it's quite, I really want to start from the, from the ground up really to, to, to work it out. I mean, I haven't got a, can you just do a big picture of what's going like how many rapid charges there are across the whole country and how uh, are they being installed now let's start with that i mean how, how yeah. widespread is the network yeah so you know we, we focus predominantly on a on a ccs network uh with some yeah. at, at our sites right but today you know over the last four years basically we've deployed 800 stations um and right stations are multiple chargers at any one station anywhere from three all the way you know well above 10 chargers at a particular site so we've deployed right. about 3,500 individual chargers across those 800 stations and so we've we've really you know in our first phase we focused heavily on the on the highway network really trying to drive that confidence in, in the driver um, that they can go anywhere in their vehicle so We've got now covered coast to coast, so you can do multiple different routes, either from north all the way to south and go across the country, and then all the connected routes, right, to take you north and south, especially along some of the main corridors, like the I-5 corridor on the west coast, or the 101 that takes you up the coast of California, or the I-95, right, on the eastern seaboard, and then several routes in, in the middle of the country. And then we're continuing mm -hmm. to build out. Uh, we're focusing a lot more now on some of the regional corridors, right, um, as well as in the metro markets, uh, building more density so that more people that don't have access to overnight charging that may live in apartments or a condo can now have access to, to ultra-fast charging so that, you know, they can charge in a few minutes and still drive electric, right? 
Um, and then we're building out a lot of the other sort of gap areas up, up in the no northern portion of the country, like North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming, Montana, and filling up right. some of those gap, bigger gaps that we had. So uh, the build out's going great. And then we have we've also have our sister company, Electrify Canada, um, that's continuing to build out uh, in all the provinces. And so we're building the Trans-Canada Highway. Uh, similar, you know, look, look and feel exactly like what you would see in, in the U.S. side. So whether you're charging right. in Vancouver or you're charging in Miami, the look, the feel, the experience, how you start a charge, everything's exactly the same. Right. And does that in include like access as in being able to access the charges and pay for them? Is there one system that would operate over the whole country? Exactly. Yeah. In, in Canada, we have the Electrify Canada app. Um, and system, but it, it mimics nicely off of the Electrify America system. And right. so all the payment systems are exactly the same and how you would find a charger, uh, get information about the charger, that's all the same. Right. And I mean, that because that's one thing that's been a, a you know, I'm, I'm trying not to reflect too much on the British situation, but there have been some frustrations, which I think is universal. I think it ha that's happened everywhere, isn't it, as, as this technology develops. But there is now a system, we're very used to in this country, uh, like a debit card with a chip tap to pay. So there's no pin involved. You just literally go beep and it, it does it. Yeah. That's how you can buy a, you know, a can of soda in a shop. It's that simple. You just go beep and it does it. And then to get that to work on chargers, on electric car chargers, just seemed to be very difficult until now. Now it's it's becoming fairly universal. But yeah. there was a, definitely a painful period because we've got quite a lot of different companies supplying chargers. So you have to have... You have like 50 apps right. and three, and then in the past, 300 cards to try and make the thing work. Make that was work. a frustration for the early adopter. But I mean, it sounds like it's a fairly, I'm just explain to me, is, is the accessing it a fairly straightforward proposition? It's not. Yeah. Once you've done it once, it gets easy. Yeah, we had some of those sort of challenges in the U.S. And, and really we wanted to make sure we provided options for everyone so that you didn't yeah. have to join a club um and download an app and do all this other other things if you didn't want to so all our yeah. terminals have a credit card reader so you can tap right. or, or dip your card um, okay. to pay for a charge and so we actually pioneered a lot of that implementation because it's like in 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 the uk it, it just simply wasn't done yet on the chart yeah so there was a, a learning curve and, and improvements made along the way to make that more and more robust and then you know obviously we built out the app and so you can um, set up a membership there and pay for a charge but the other thing we've done is now integrate a lot of our platform into the automakers platform right. so um, like if you have a, a Porsche vehicle, they have their, their Porsche ecosystem where the customers can sign up, you know, for their energy plan and then access and start a charge uh, right from the vehicle. Ford Pass does the same thing. Um, right. So we've integrated into a lot of the OEMs ecosystems, just whatever, yeah. whatever, you know, works best for that individual customer. Uh, and then we've developed technologies like plug in charge uh, so that, you know, once you register, you set up your account. And then now you just have to go in and plug in and it, the car automatically identifies itself right. and it starts charging. So no need to take out an app, no need to take out um, a credit yeah. card or anything like that. And so it just makes the process even easier. So we've continued to develop different bits of technology to, to further make the payment mechanism easier and easier, but always want to make sure that we have an open system so that anyone can go up and get a charge uh, ultimately. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I mean, that sounds like you've, it, I think we've now turned a corner internationally where there, because there was so much pain in the early days of, of, of charging, you know, it was, it was, and it was a, it was a kind of a, an own goal for when you were trying to promote electric driving and electric vehicles and you'd meet a journalist who'd never driven an electric car and he wasn't necessarily even being deliberately negative but he'd go up to a charger and go i don't know what to do <laughs> you know, i don't know how to make this work and the amount of people i've helped at charges i just go no it's baffling you know it's really you know it is really complicated you know if you want to buy gasoline you go out there you fill your tank and you pay for it and that's the end of it that's you know it's, yeah. it was so it's really good that, that, yeah. that you've and we studied, we studied that use case quite a bit, right? We talked to customers before we started deploying our systems and, and yeah. talked through, you know, what, what are your pain points? And that exactly is the one you've, you've pointed out, right? Try to figure out what app to use. And then if it is an app that maybe has access to that charger, it doesn't yeah. communicate, right? There's all these break, breaking points. And so yeah. we said, okay, well, let's get to the lowest common denominator. What, what are people actually used to? And, and let's, let's develop that. Let's implement that as sort of like the baseline so that everyone yeah. can access 
this a charge? And then you build on top of that different features and functionality to make the process even easier. Should the customer choose to want to want to go down that path? Yeah, because then the other challenge I know that well, the other perceived challenge in the UK is that. Uh, uh, people, you know, I would just hear someone say or tweet or they'd leave a comment, you know, with all, if there's too many electric cars, it will melt the grid or it won't cope and all that stuff. And it's been very useful for us. To, so like one of the head engineers at the national grid who run our national grid, who run the whole system, has said repeatedly on TV, in radio interviews, on podcasts, no, it's fine. It won't melt the grid. <laughs> there's not a problem. You know, the, you know, there might be a local uh, supply problem, but there isn't a national one. It's like a not it, that isn't an issue, which has kind of killed that that particular argument. But I mean, I'm just thinking of my limited experience of. I've spent quite a lot of time in the United States, but there is a. It's a really big country. <laughs> We're sort of the size of a small state, yeah. And you're dealing with so many different networks and grid connections. I mean, that's one. The question I'm getting to eventually is. Are you having trouble with with sites with the supply to some sites? If you want to put in ten charges, you, you've got the room to do it, but there's no no electricity supply. And how are you dealing with those complexities? Yeah, I mean the, the U.S. We've got you know probably well over twenty five hundred different utilities uh, across right. the country. Um, the grids are sort of broken up into into different regions. Um, so so each region has its own unique characteristics in terms of what the grid can handle. Um, but generally, I would say for the most part, on all our deployments, we've really never had an issue um, uh, to, you know, 99% of the cases in terms of getting the connection we needed uh, to put that that infrastructure out. And one of the things we do is, you know, we we engage very early with the utilities. And what we do is we bring to the table, here's here's our next four-year plan or five-year plan in terms of what we're going to deploy in the approximate areas where we're going to deploy these stations. And then here's the load profile we're going to, we're actually going to see over that or that over that time horizon and then if not even farther so it really gives the system planners quite a bit of information to kind of make right. appropriate decisions uh about you know they can give us infrastructure today but knowing the load profile they're going to see in the next year to two years based on our projections and they can say okay well I, I can do my system upgrades maybe three years from now or if i even need to right so they can kind of help plan out their 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 process so that's been a very good engagement overall. But I would say, you know, there have been a couple instances where um, we'll go to a site and say, okay, well, we want, you know, two megawatts worth of load um, or, or connection here, or sometimes even up to three. And the utility says, well, well we only have 800 kilowatts and you're going to have to wait right. another four or five years before we can do the system upgrade to get that interconnection there. So one of the things we've been experimenting with and have actually deployed now is battery storage to help buffer and provide um, that buffer so that we can still output that you know two to three megs possible so if everyone showed yeah. up and pulled it we're able to deliver it based on the batteries uh, and then we've actually incorporated solar as well into our large canopy systems to be able to you know take whatever we can from the sun fill up the batteries take whatever is available from the grid and fill up the batteries at off peak times and so that's helped uh, alleviate and that's what we call sort of our non-wires alternative Right. Yeah. Kind of bring a whole wire in from the utility. We'll just take whatever you have. We'll sip off of that, and then we'll have the buffer to be able to still meet the output we need. And especially when you look at and what the, the one site in particular where we've done this is in Baker, California, which is right between LA and Vegas. Right. So every Friday night or Thursday night, you get all these happy, <laughs> happy uh, gamblers going out to Vegas. <laughs> right. Uh, and they're usually <laughs> coming home um, either crying or happy. <laughs> You never yes. know, but they but they still need a charge and they want to get yeah. and so making sure we have that capacity available for them is very important so it's yeah. sites like that you know that that kind of thing um it becomes very important and and then also too we've deployed now uh, gosh we're we're heading up to almost 200 sites now with battery storage where right. uh, we're actually right. incorporating that with our dc chargers and we're using it more from a grid impact standpoint so it helps lower our what we call demand charges so it helps lower our our overall bill but then right. in the, um, on the on the flip side we're able to then reduce our our exposure on the grid so the grid sees you know less usage coming from yeah. our site which is great and then in, in certain regions especially in california we've been able to aggregate those assets as well so we have all these all these energy storage devices throughout the state we're able to aggregate them to make them look like one virtual power plant essentially right and then we're able to deliver or deliver services back to the grid to the wholesale market 
um, for, for demand response and things like that. So we're providing additional support as we get into the hot summer months and, and times when the grid really needs that extra power and, and less stress, we're able to, to deliver services back to grid to, to help it out. And to us, it's another revenue stream we can, we can generate uh, to right. help, you know, provide sustainability for the network. Yeah. Because I mean, the, the other thing I'm intrigued at, so I, the last time I was in the United States, I did drive from Los Angeles to Vegas, uh, but not, I was annoyingly, because I was with a TV crew, not in a, an electric vehicle, but we did, so So where is your station, sorry, you, you did say, and I just, I've just forgotten where it, it was. It's Baker, the, California, it's about halfway. Baker, that's, yep. yes, is it, that, is, so we did stop there, so I'm, ra so how many charge, because I remember they was, there was a big, uh, we had lunch there, and there was a big Tesla supercharger yep. site there, that had a queue when we went, there was a queue of Teslas, it's the yep. only time I've ever seen that, that, that doesn't happen in in this country but it was clearly very very busy um but there, so is that is that in the same area as that yeah, is we're it? actually right next door um, right so okay i know exactly where it is then okay yeah, exactly. That's right. yeah. so we've yeah. got uh, several charges there we're, we're upgrading the system now to all 350 kilowatt capable right. chargers um so yeah it's an exciting site all ccs uh with some charge right as well but that's i'm assuming that's a bit one of your busier locations yeah absolutely like i said every thursday and friday and sunday yeah so. It gets, gets quite a bit of traffic, but yeah. But again, an important route, right? Um, yeah. On a, when, when they get there, they want to be able to charge and get on their way. Uh, and yeah. so having the right amount of capacity is very important. Yes, yeah. But that is fascinating. So, I mean, I'm, that's the other thing that I have have witnessed at a very low level is like a, a couple of charging networks in this country and in Europe, where if you go to their offices and you see their control systems and all their screens uh, uh, judging how much, it, it's also... I think the surprise is for me as a, as a, you know, an outsider to that industry, how often, how little a charger is used as opposed to how much it's used, you know, and that's what's now changing. I think this is, I'm talking maybe five years ago yeah, when there were far cool. less and that, and I actually met, so there's a, a company in um, the Netherlands called Fastned, a charging mm -hmm. network in the Netherlands. Yeah. And that, I've spoken to one of the, their people recently and they said, Oh, they're, usage has gone up so steeply in the last sort of 18 months it's unbelievable oh, how how yeah. much more utilization they're getting than they originally than they originally experienced when they put the system in i'm are you seeing a growth in the united states of similar oh, size i mean last year we did one almost one and a half million sessions uh on the network wow. and i can tell you right now uh, we're, we're on pace to, to far exceed that so the growth is right. just tremendous and i think you look at like you know states like california that you know, the yeah. percentage now are all, you know, new vehicle sales are all EVs, um, you know, it's 60, you know, typically 60% of the U.S. market, um, just, you know, the, the growth we've seen in the state so far has been phenomenal and continues right. to grow and grow and grow. Uh, and we're starting to see that now all the other states uh, starting to catch up. Uh, so I say in general, you know, utilization is up. Uh, people are getting into EVs. Um, you see more and more adoption happening and, and it's fantastic. Yeah. And I mean, presumably then, the, the, you know, the existence of your network has got to give people, you know, say someone who's never driven an electric vehicle, but they pass by one of your charging stations and they're going to go, oh, OK, that's where you go. <laughs> that's where these newfangled electric cars get charged. <laughs> yeah. it, that, that, I mean, I think that the visibility of it is a very important aspect, isn't it? In a way? Oh, absolutely. Right. It's it's all about having that visibility and then the size and scale of each of the stations is important. Right. Because that, that yeah. sort of you know that availability that reliability and that confidence sets into into the consumer when they see it so you know yeah. it's more than just having a dot on the map right it's the quality of that dot that and what what's what's behind that dot that really at the end of the day will drive the confidence of the consumer to want to get into and stay in an, an, in an ev and so we've really got to keep that mission up and the other area we've really focused on is this ultra fast charging right 150 yeah. kilowatts to 350 kilowatt charge rates which have now really become the two standards uh in the yeah. industry especially here in north america um so it's either you know what does your car do 150 or 350 and you kind of figure yeah. out it's kind of like regular or premium right it's yes <laughs> in the gas world uh and so you know if the cars can have that have that capability we see you know the charge rate the average charge rate in vehicles continue to increase now getting from 150 all the way up to 200 kilowatts and then you see you know the outliers that are that are pushing you know 350 kilowatt charge rates which is phenomenal so we see vehicles and the capability of those vehicles going up to match now 
uh, the, the infrastructure we've put out and, and people right. now have, they have the cars, they have the infrastructure and they can take advantage of that. And so we're really starting to get to a point where we're, we're almost matching the fueling experience of today in terms of time. Um, obviously it takes, you know, a few more minutes to, to charge an EV, but you know, it's minutes, not, you know, yeah, half, yeah. even half an hour to that matter. Yeah. Now there's still, I still regularly will read a tweet in my timeline that says, I, I haven't got the time to spend three hours waiting for my car to charge. And you go, That's a, it's just such a, you know, it's just like, it's just, I don't want to know. It's three hours, 10 hours, you know, go, yeah, all day. Yeah. No, it isn't, but never mind. Uh, you know, you, I've kind of given up now replying because I just think you're working out <laughs> at some point. But yeah, then, the, the, yeah. Yeah. But then with, well, another area that I'm uh, very aware of in this country is the, the uh, in some ways, more rapid explosion of, uh, small commercial vehicles, so delivery vans and uh, public transport. You know, I've just been in London. I, left, I was in London last night and this morning, and all the buses I saw, the public, all the public transport is is now not all of it, but a huge proportion is electric. It's been a, in some ways much faster than electric cars. You know, there were say five years ago loads of electric cars in London. No, all the buses were diesel. All the delivery vans were diesel. All the taxis are diesel. You go there now, maybe fifty percent of the taxis are electric a hell of a lot of the delivery vans, but that obviously needs its own, in a sense, particularly commercial uh, delivery vans need their own network. Do you, are you involved in any of that, those areas of of commercial, of charging commercial vehicles or public transport or that area? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we've all right. taken all our, all our knowledge that we've done today in terms of actually deploying and owning and ma maintaining infrastructure for ourselves, and we've taken that now and are doing it for others. So right. we do it across a few different ways, and we've opened up a, a, a separate business unit to kind of handle those kind of applications called Electrify Commercial. And so we do a lot of work for you know utilities uh, across the country that want to deploy public infrastructure that maybe want to fill in gaps that the commercial market isn't necessarily filling in. And so we'll work with them closely to actually do a turnkey service uh, because it's not their expertise um, yeah. and, and area, you know, to actually maintain and, and manage a, a network of chargers. So we'll come in and, and help to do that for them. And then we also do a lot of behind the fence applications, as, as you mentioned, yeah. or we'll help a, 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 a business that's, you know, converting their fleet to electric, uh, and be able then to figure out, okay, what kind of infrastructure do you need behind the fence? What, what, what is, you know, how many cars do you have? How, what's their use profile? What are their charge times? And then build out the, the system to be able to meet their needs. Uh, and then you have to really look at the electrical impact, right? Because sometimes you're getting yeah. quite, a bit, quite a bit of power. So, you know, do we integrate solar? Do we integrate batteries? Uh, and so we're actually working on a really big project right now um, that helps services the, the ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles. Um, because, you know, the ports are, you know, the mo one of the heavily utilized ports in the world um, and for sure the United States. And so there's a lot of containers that get picked up by trucks uh, from the port and then taken um, to uh, taken inland to big distribution centers. And so uh, a lot of those trucks, right, they're all diesel. They run right through the middle of Los Angeles in some really low and income uh, uh, disadvantaged communities. And yeah. so the, the, the impact they provide from an air pollution standpoint is is uh, pretty negative. And so really trying to drive electrification in those trucks is very important uh, for those communities. And so we're working on some projects. And one big one we're working on was with NFI, which is a large truck company here in the United States, where they're going to electrify, um, you know, a couple dozen of their trucks, if not more, uh, to help you know, uh, right. provide that, that cargo for the port um, to their distribution facility. And so we're working with them to provide charging behind the fence to be able to manage and maintain their entire fleet of, of trucks, of Class A trucks. Um, and integrated into that is a huge storage system, a huge solar system. Right. But again, if you look at the parallels, like I mentioned with Baker, right, um, at our site where we're doing the same thing, Right. We're, we're taking all those learnings now and, and bringing it to the fleet space. Right. Because we've done this for ourselves. And now right. we're bringing that to help them manage and maintain their fleet. That is so exciting because it's all those things that I remember here discussing and having explained to me the theory of what you're talking about. Like maybe seven, eight years ago. And it's so wonderful to hear that this is actually actually being put into practice. You know, the notion of putting, you know, using batteries and solar in, in relation to car charging. It's so painfully obvious. I mean, particularly somewhere like California. I mean, maybe I, I, I always think, well, somewhere like British Columbia, where I have been, I, I, I'm guessing is less sunny. But I mean, I, you know, I've been to California a lot and it's never been 
overcast for more than a day and a half. You know, it's sunny. It's a sunny right. place. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And so taking advantage of that and, and helping reduce costs. And I think what's happened too is you've seen sort of the economies of scale starting to catch up. Yeah, right. right. Seen, you know, the, the manufacturing of batteries now is starting to increase and a lot of these systems, the price points are starting to come down. And so the economics start to make sense more and right. more versus where we were, you know, five, six years ago. And yeah. then just the critical mass of vehicles um, is is increasing overall. So so you see this growth, and so you know, uh, rising tides lifts all boats. And so yeah. same thing you see with you know the price of, of all the products continue to go down and down, and then the capabilities right of all the different components continue to increase. And so it's an exciting time. I think we're going to continue to see that in the future, um, and uh, and so there's going to be more and more of this. So being able to be on the forefront to pioneer this to really deploy it. And really figure out the use cases where it works, where it doesn't work, or what are the things that we need to work on to to make sure it it, it works correctly and provides the impact that that we expect it to um, is is a huge huge uh, you know opportunity for us and and something that we're out in the forefront and putting out infrastructure that you know four years ago people thought we were crazy we were putting out 150 yeah. kilowatt and 350 kilowatt chargers but now you know it's like they want more of it right and they want yeah. all 350 they want faster and faster yes. um, so it's uh so it's, it's kind of refreshing it's a it's a bit validating uh to yeah. a lot of the thought and work we did early on but i mean i think it is extraordinary that the, the kind of critical role that california has had in the development of particularly electric vehicles but then the knock-on sort of technologies that you know where we utilize batteries and solar and all that stuff but it has been my experience of being there in the early early parts of this century where there, i kept hearing these things from engineers i would meet in in california who's going i'm working on battery management systems which in 2000 or 2002 meant nothing i mean what the hell is he talking about what is battery <laughs> i'm looking at electric propulsion what you know it just it meant nothing at all to me in my you know it took me years to kind of catch up but i learned sort of backwards about the Californian Air Resource Board, about the air quality in Los Angeles, about uh, how, in a sense, the, the, this, this new generation of electric transport came out of the computer industry rather than the automotive industry, that whole thing. But I mean, that is, it still sounds like California is still in many ways at the forefront of that, from what you're telling me of what, what you're installing there. It's... Yeah, absolutely. I think California just generally in the, in the country has, has been at the forefront of the electric movement and, uh, and continues to be that way, not only just from a transportation side, but even from a grid side, right? And the impact renewables and the change renewables has had on our on our grid, but that also brings on, along with it a lot of challenges, right? As you bring yeah. both of these pieces together, right? As you go to more more renewables on the grid, the more inflexibility the grid becomes. And so how you deal with that uh, becomes a, a bigger and bigger problem. And we start to see that and the grids start to get challenged, you know, at these, you know, 10 years ago, the peak was more from in California, it was like 2 p.m. to maybe 5 p.m. And now because so much renewables on the on the grid, we see that becomes now there's there's plenty of energy during those hours. It's more when the sun starts to go down at 6 p.m. Right. 9 p.m. and everybody comes home. So the peak has shifted. And so how do you deal with that peak uh, as you move more and more to renewables? And that's where, you know, storage becomes a, a more and more critical impact. But then when you look at tra electric transportation, you know, you, you want everyone to electrify. Well, you know, how do those two things meet up and how do you keep both systems happy in terms of yeah. people wanting to go electric, be able to drive wherever they want to, be able to fuel essentially whatever they want to, but still provide, you know, stability and, and not, you know, overstress the grid, especially as you get to, you know, these, these peak times. And so that's where we really try to figure out, you know, what are those dynamics? How can we play sort of that, that the middleman sort of approach, um, bring all the intelligence and technology to our site so we're able to manage both ends of that equation still give the customer what they want in terms of so that they can go do what they need to do and carry on you know their livelihoods and and, e -com and commerce in general but still you know make sure that that we're not overstressing the grid and so california has played the forefront of that but now you see all the other states starting to catch up uh, right. and so we, we do a lot of work on the east coast um, and there's a lot of great thought leadership coming from other other um, states in the country. So it's really great to see that it's just not California alone anymore. It's actually yeah. a, a bigger portion of the union that's really trying to push this forward. Yeah. The, I mean, it is, it's, a, it's just such a, uh, a huge change. And I mean, the potential technologies that are emerging that I'm seeing emerge now, so it just 
you, you know, I think to the, to someone who's not at, completely outside. I admit I do live in a bit of an electric vehicle bubble, as I'm sure most <laughs> people who work in this industry do. But then occasionally I'll talk to someone who's not really thought about it, and they are open map. They just go, "What? They had they'd not thought of all those things." So I'm talking, you know, simple things. Well, like solar panels, batteries, but also vehicle to grid, all those other possibilities that are just starting to 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 come about now. It's it's it you know it's a, a critical. Um, I'm sure, you know, I know you'll be aware of this, but a critically important part of the kind of learning process for all of us is it's not just about you plug a car in, you unplug it, you drive. There's a, there's a whole other array of technologies and potentials there, you know, benefits as well as challenges. I mean, it just opens up such a, the, the ecosystem is far and wide, right? It's just yeah. not about how you charge, but everything that goes behind actually getting those electrons to the car and, and doing it in a cost-effective way that still makes you want to stay electric. Um, yeah. All the way through, like you talked about, you know, vehicle to grid, you know, one of the big things that's becoming uh, very important now is we see, you know, the effects of climate change and more severe weather, we see more, more outages, right? So just having your vehicle be that, that energy source for your home, so vehicle to yeah. home, um, not even necessarily pushing power onto the grid, but just enough to keep your refrigerators, maybe an air conditioner and some other devices on in your house and, and keep the yeah. lights on. Um, like, you know, the, during those cold weather events, like in, in Texas, or sometimes we have brownouts here in California for one reason or another, right? So having that, that capability to still um, uh, keep the lights on is, is, is fantastic. So it really, it broadens the application, broadens the use of, of an electric car, and, and really the ecosystem yeah. is, is far and wide. Because one of the things I meant to ask you right early on, and I've just remembered it now, is the 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 funding so have you because uh, is electrify america does that have funding from government funding from federal government funding or is it an entirely commercial enterprise what what yeah, is this so what? The, the electrify america was is is a was a solely owned <laughs> subsidiary of volkswagen uh, group of america right okay so good we were funded yeah, so originally by then and then um, just recently we announced an investment uh, a follow-on investment from Volkswagen itself, Excel itself, but also from Siemens, uh, who also invested right. in Electrify America. And so we're continuing to, to um, invest more money and, and continue to build out our stations and our technology. But that's fascinating then. So because I think there's going to be listeners to this that may not know that full story. I'm guessing this is a, 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 as a result of one of the results of Dieselgate of that whole scandal that there was. Can you explain how that works? So there was a kind of fine imposed on the company, but it wasn't give us money. It was pay for this, pay for electric vehicle charging. Is that have I got that even close to right? Yeah, as part of as part of that settlement, Volkswagen made the commitment to invest in zero emission vehicle infrastructure. Uh, and, and, and that commitment was about a $2, two billion investment over 10 years. Um, right. And so that was the initial um, uh, investment that came in. And our intent has always been to really drive the market forward, but also build a sustainable company that will last well after right. those yes. years. And so that's really what we've done. And so, you know, we've really focused on building that ultra fast charging network that, you know, because the number one pain point we hear from customers is we want confidence that we can go where we want and charge as fast as possible. That was sort of yeah. the, the the big theme that we we took out. And so we said, okay, the best way to, to, to take this investment is to really focus on building that network. And so you see that today, right? There's no other CCS network that even matches our, our breadth and scope and, and, right. and reach that we've, we've built it today. And, uh, and, and, you know, like I said before, people thought we were crazy by installing 350 kilowatt chargers in the ground. And, and now, like, people want more. Uh, yeah. So we're, yeah. We're building bigger and, and more far reaching. But that is an amazing, uh, you know, that short history is fascinating. And I mean, I'm just hoping like in 100 years time, people go, you know why we're all trying to, <laughs> it's because, you know, it kind of was a pretty pivotal moment in, in automotive history, if you like, that, that you know, a European company that I've, I always had Volkswagens, you know, before I had electric cars, I was always driving Volkswagen Golfs or Beetles, it was just part, I didn't even think about it. And then you go, and they seemed like a really trust. They, I don't want to be rude about anyone, but they were seemed like like a respectable, proper, solid German trustworthy company. And it turns out they really were quite bad. <laughs> and I think it's. I don't think we need to shy away from that. But I've, I'm fascinated by the the response to that of the U.S. government to say this is really what you did is criminally bad, 
but we're, we're going to make you do this. And it has, it does seem to have worked. It's such a remarkable story that if, um, you know, there, there, there were certainly times in the UK where the government gave money to a, a company and they put in some charges in the worst place. They didn't service them. They never worked. It was, you know, there was a kind of a period of very profound pain where you'd find a one charger behind the public lavatory at a town hall where you couldn't get in the car park yeah. and they proudly say we've put in a car charger for green this future and you go no you haven't that's no <laughs> use it's no use to yeah. man nor beast but what you've done is such a big step that in like pub this is look here it is it's here it works you can use it it's fast but you know etc yeah, which absolutely. is a fantastic story one of the things we did is we actually looked at a lot of other um, funding um, and, and penalties that have been paid in the past from other companies um, who had to put out infrastructure um, in a similar sort of scheme. And, and we certainly so learned from those examples of, you know, you just put one charger here, one charger there, one charger yeah. there, and you sort of set it and forget it. And that really, you know, at the end of the day, our, our core mission is to drive zero emission vehicle adoption, right? And so one thing is to, okay, we'll put out ultra fast charging, we'll put out big stations and put them everywhere. But if you don't service and maintain them and keep, you know, keep the network alive and working at a reliable state, then we know that doesn't that 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 takes away from our core mission, right? And that's a, yeah. that's a core mission that all of us at Electrify American are are one hundred percent vested, and this is why we come to this company. And so, yeah. you know, making sure we have the robustness around the technology, around the service network, everywhere across North America is extremely important. We built, we, you know, we built a whole lab in Reston, Virginia where we have every make and model of charger we deploy. We have dozens of electric vehicles that we're continually doing interoperability testing, right. continually taking data from the field in terms of errors and other things that we've seen. We're replicating those, those situations in the lab and driving the corrective actions, whether they're in the charger, whether they're in the vehicle within our network system and pushing that those, those improvements across the board. And so now we've picked, we've actually become a pretty important component, say for auto, auto development, right? So one of the things the automakers do is when they're developing a new car, they'll bring their prototype to our lab to be able to test, to make sure that they're getting their software right um, and won't see issues in the field. And so we have a very close coordination in, in, with that regard. And so just generally, I think, you know, what we're really proud of is what we've been able to bring to the industry in terms of hardware manufacturers understanding better how their hardware works in the field or how bad it works in the field yeah. uh, and being able to, to drive the improvements needed. And then also from the automaker standpoint, being able to come to one place where they're able to test interoperability and make sure they're designing their cars so it's a seamless integration and it's not perfect we're not we're not you know we're by far we're not we're not to the you know to 100 percent reliability and where we'd like to be but it's because we have these systems in place we're able to quickly capture you know what's going on and then work with these manufacturers to, to drive those continuous improvements right because i mean that's something i definitely feel from my um, you know the 13 or now years i've been driving electric cars is regardless of what happened in the past, the technology is, it feels like is getting more reliable. I'm coming across less chargers that don't work. And I, you know, I've certainly suffered <laughs> long and hard in my life with chargers that don't work, but it seems to be less common. I mean, would you say the technology, it feels like it's maturing? I mean, is that your experience? Because what you're that uh, center you've set up just sounds like a critically important thing to, yeah, to it, be able I, to I, test it, all it, those things. Yeah, the technology is, it is improving, but we've got a long ways to go. Um, you know, right. when we started right. essentially four or five years ago, we had to work quickly to get, you know, what we thought were best in class chargers that were being manufactured and get those, uh, get those deployed at, with 150 kilowatt, 350 kilowatt uh, capability. Um, and so, you know, we put, all, we have a lot of expectations on our suppliers in terms of the response times we want, the engineering support the service, the spare parts, everything that comes with, you know, deploying chargers to make sure we can provide a high level of reliability. And not everyone's been able to keep up, right? And so yeah. I could say, you know, five years ago, we started with four manufacturers. There was one that just wasn't cutting it. Um, they weren't able to offer the service and support we needed to drive those continuous improvements. And so we went out, it was across the Eastern seaboard. We actually ripped out 60 sites, um, wow. all their equipment out of the field and put new equipment in. And so, and and so, a lot of that early equipment, we still we still have a lot of growing pains. Um, you know, it's one thing that's maybe the hardware, but then if we're not getting that right kind of service and support from the the end manufacturer, then we'll have some tough decisions to make. Because at the end of the day, right, 
we want to stand behind our brand in terms of what that represents. Yeah. And really, you know, at the end of the day, we have to drive confidence to the consumer and a reliable yeah. charging station is, is paramount to that. Right. And it's that's absolutely vital. And yeah. that yeah. is what drives, you know, zero emission vehicle adoption. Uh, and so, you know, we're continually driving our suppliers, driving the technology and what you see in, in sort of our generation of equipment, we're already on our fourth generation now is we've actually right. taken what we think are the best suppliers and work with them to build more and more capability in the charger. So we've taken a vested interest in terms of the actual design of the charger. What diagnostics do we get out of the charger? Different things we want to see improvements and have built that into the charger so it's better suited for our needs, right? Um, and, and, and we can deploy it and have more remote diagnostics, more you know, remote um, preventative maintenance type of things, uh, as well as service support and support when we have to go out there. So you see our chargers become more and more unique to Electrify America because we have to, right? We have to make right. sure that we can deliver that that experience that, that customers expect. Yeah. And I mean, it's interesting, the thing you mentioned, because that's certainly something I wasn't aware of until I talked to a couple of the big charging networks in the UK is that you naturally, as a driver, you naturally assume if a charger doesn't work, it's the charger, as in that's that doesn't work, it's broken. <laughs> you don't think it's the car, but the amount of times they say, well, when this particular model came out, as soon as anyone plugged that into any charger, it broke the charger and it wasn't the car, it wasn't the charger, it was the car. And that's fascinating that now that's what we need desperately is the manufacturers to go, hang on, just before we release this fabulous new model, let's just plug it into every charger that exists and see see what happens. You know, that's a, so that's what your, t that test facility sounds fabulous. I mean, that's amazing. Yeah, it was, it was one of the core things and one of the first things we built, right? Because right. you'll talk to a charger manufacturer and they say, oh, it works with all cars, right? And yeah. <laughs> then you deploy, you're like, oh boy, we can't do anything with this charger. Yeah. So it's, it's you know, it's a bit of trust but verify um, uh, in yeah. the, what the manufacturers have given us and also to what the, what the automakers are developing. Uh, it's really a place to bring all parties together, right? To make sure we're yeah. sort of in an unbiased approach, really focused on how do we make this a seamless experience, right? Because there's, it's new technology. A lot of these traditional automakers are now having to become software companies and having yeah. to help this for the first time. And although they're, you know, they're very strict standards in terms of, you know, the, the communication protocol and how things work, there's, there's sometimes a little bit of gray area. Um, yeah. And also too, just how you, design your car, maybe you put your port in the front of the vehicle, but your communication line runs all the way to the back of the car and it can generate noise. And when you plug it into this, things get a little haywire. So it's all yeah. these little nuances that we're able to discover together and be able to work on and, and fix uh, for, for at the end of the day for the customer just to have a seamless experience. Yeah. Because that is a that is a fascinating turn of events. I recently used a, 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 a we have a, a, a VW ID four, and I I used it. I tried it out on a supercharger, a Tesla supercharger, because one that was compat you know would allow other cars to charge. Yeah. And of course, what you immediately realise is the charge ports on the other side of the car. So you effectively, if you are using it, luckily it wasn't busy at the time, but you're taking up two spaces. So I'm parking in one space where I would normally charge my Tesla, but I have to charge for using the next door stand. But I mean, that is a, it's so complicated, that thing where the charge ports are all over cars. Every car, cause I test drive car, every car it's in a different place. And I go, what, Oh, what, how, how do you get that in? <laughs> yeah. But that's gotta be something you take into account when you're designing a, you know, a lot of, if you're putting a lot of charges, you've got to work out, oh, wait a minute, they've got to be able to park forwards, backwards, slightly sideways. Can it reach the front if it's up there? You know, yeah, that stuff it, is complicated. You have to deal with every type of scenario, not every type of also, but also every type of parking lot, right? So yeah. it might not all be head-in parking and maybe in between stalls and then trying to design right. one piece of equipment that's good for any of those types of scenarios and any type yeah. of port location is very is, is extremely difficult. So in our first generation yes. of hardware, we actually developed a charger that had two connectors and it's really so that we can reach more sides of the vehicle right. rather than... Oh, so this, this would be... This would be like two CCS. It wasn't like one CCS, one channel. It's two. Two CCS, wow. just so that we can get to any port, you know, on the yeah. vehicle without having to have a complex mechanical system and, you know, 20 feet of cable or, or you know, five meters yeah. of cable length. And so that, that became really challenging. And then now on our latest generation of charger, we're actually, we've gone back and incorporated a mechanical system to, uh, to have, handle the cables. So we've gone to one cable now. 
um, right. I think we can get away with it. But, uh, but yeah, but having to deal with all those different ports and every type of vehicle um, is, is extremely challenging. And then trying to fit that into every type of location that we're in so that we can yeah. still meet the need of the driver uh, is tricky. And making sure that drivers don't have to, you know, block three three yes. just to, just to, charge just to plug in sure. <laughs> but then what, one last thing i'd love to ask you is uh because this is a thing i've done a couple of times where i've kind of kept a record of it and kept it which is that i that, uh, that i will do a journey where i never wait to charge a car i.e destination charging so so i've done there are there's a, a route i can do which involves where i work and where i'm doing thing, doing shopping so I drive to where I work. While I'm at work, I plug in, and I might only add fifty miles, mm. but that's enough. And I go to then to a, a shopping centre where normally in real life I would never go, but because it's got free destination charging, I go there, do my shopping. That gives me enough to get home. So I've done this whole route, and I've never wait because so I'm doing something else while I'm charging. So I just I didn't know whether you you also supply destination charging or car like lower speed, uh, you know, uh, yeah. in a car park or something like that. Yeah, our focus has been more um, ultra fast charging in the public, but also yeah. home charging. So we do have an electrify oh, right. product line. Um, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. And so, so you can install a, an electrify America home charging box yeah. type of so thing. We, we focus right. more on the home side because that's still where 78% of the charging yeah. happens here in the US. Um, and so we've developed a, a smart home charger that all integrates nicely into the app so you can get all your public charging as well as as, as right. people charging all in one place. We've looked at some of the destination, and I think destination charging becomes kind of a, it's a, it's a, it's a tricky one, right? Um, yeah. Providing enough destination chargers, especially as we get to more critical mass of the vehicle is very difficult. And so then it becomes more uh, opportunity charge. So I'll go there if there's, you know, if there happens to be a spot open and I don't have to pay too much, I'll take it, but yeah. I'm not going there because I have to, I need it. Right. Yeah. And so, um, that it becomes a challenge of what's the real need of that destination. Now, obviously, I think yeah. as we get to, you look at a lot of hotels and other sort of destination, vacation destinations and things like that, that becomes um, uh, a, a good use case. But I think as you see the proliferation of more ultra fast charging, right, across the country and across metro areas, um, you know, I think we'll see the, the amount of home charging begin to decrease and the amount right. of public charging continue to increase because now with this robustness of the ultra fast charging network, you really have more people being able to get into electric vehicles that live in apartments or condos that don't have a dedicated place to change to charge yeah. or you know don't have a workplace that has, has chargers for them. But because they have this ultra fast network, they can go once a week get their three to 400 miles of range, right? And have enough um, range for the, for the whole week, right? To do all the work, work yeah. uh, trips and everything else like that. Um, and then when they're ready, they can go back and the next week charge up, maybe get yeah. their groceries while they're, while they're charging up for that 30 minutes uh, and, and be ready for the week. Right. And just one final thing, because we, because it's a, a, such a huge story for us here in the UK at the moment, but are your, uh, is your price per kilowatt hour <laughs> remaining relatively stable in the, say the next year because <laughs> it's not here i'm just saying <laughs> so we don't know we don't quite know what's going to happen here but i mean it just it is a terrifying moment we're going through in this country but yeah yeah i, I think for us right it's governed state by state so not every state across the united states allows kilowatt hour charging um uh, right. so we're in about half the states now that do allow kilo, uh, kilowatt hour charging and so um and what we do there is we keep one uniform price across the country um, right. so that, you know, again, I think what we want to, we want to build that confidence, that reliability, that, that consistency across the country um, yeah. to help people just feel at ease to go electric and to, and to take their car farther and farther. And then in states where we're not allowed to charge by kilowatt hour, we can charge by minute. And it, there again, right. across all those states, we, we keep a consistent price. Right. That is fascinating. That is because I, I, because we're running out of time, but I'm just, that's the most intriguing thing. I've never even heard of that. So there's actual legislation in place in some states, which state you can't sell it by the kilowatt hour. You can only sell it by time. 
Well, you, you can't sell electricity. You, you're not allowed to resell electricity. So typically, the, the, the utility in that area has has the jurisdiction has the, monopoly, basically wow. the, the only reseller of electricity, and doesn't allow a third party then to resell electricity. Right. So little by little, states have been changing uh, their legislation right. to allow, especially for electric uh, electric vehicle use cases. But it's a it's an ongoing process, and and yeah. like I said, about half the states still still do not allow it. Um, but even then. And those states were allowed to, to charge by by minute, where we're not technically by minute. reselling electricity. Right, but I mean, if you say if you're charging in one of those states for say thirty minutes, you are you roughly paying the same that you would if you were charging thirty minutes, but you were paying per kilowatt hour. I mean, does the end cost are they relatively close? Um, we try to keep it relatively close. Obviously, you know, battery charges you know, faster in the beginning and then, and then yeah, slow sure. down. So the amount of energy you're getting in that, in that unit of time is a little less. Um, so it really depends on the actual use case, but I would say for right. 80 to 90% of the cases, we try to match it up so that it, it is a similar sort of price. But that's a, that's a, a very, I don't think there's a, yeah, that the, the, we, the, no, one, no charging network in the UK has to deal with that. <laughs> <laughs> but that is it's been really interesting talking to you robert it is fascinating because it is a you know anyone who drives an electric car is already so familiar with that say in people we have listeners in you know all over europe and australia and new zealand and this country you know to, that it is quite a uh it, it feels like there was a time when i would have argued that that there were European countries, including the UK, that were slightly ahead in terms of the spread and the accessibility of public charging. But it sounds like you've made a real quantum leap in the last, you know, four or five years. Really, really changed the picture very dramatically in the United States. It's a, an extraordinary Absolutely. story. We're not, we're not stopping there. You know, we've announced our boost announcement. We're essentially we're doubling right. down. We're trying to get to ten thousand uh, chargers uh, by twenty twenty six and eighteen hundred sites across the country. So wow, we've got a we've, big big increase. Absolutely. Yeah. So you know all this scale and processes and everything that we developed to 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 fuel this development just continues on. Um, and right. so that's what's needed, right? The, the amount of yeah. cars that are being sold. You saw what's happening in California with the announcement by twenty thirty five. No more yeah. sales of gas-powered vehicles. So the, the 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 inflection point is here, and so we've really got to work hard to try to stay ahead of this because uh, consumers are going to be there; they're going to need to charge, and uh, and so it's exciting times. But, but we're up yeah. to, we're up to the case, and and uh, that's fantastic. And I'm assuming now, like if you measured the time of you developing the first, say, when you put in like maybe eight chargers somewhere really early on. The time it takes to to put in eight charges somewhere else now, I'm guessing, is shorter because you've just learned, you've done it so many times by now. You're kind yeah, of working. We've you know, certainly like, figured out where to where to decrease time and make things go faster. But what, yeah. with that really, the machine has to has to run, and so the amount of sites we have in in construction or any bit of you know different sections of the pipeline um, is pretty robust, so that we can just continually um, build station after station. And so right. you know, we've gotten to the point where we're almost about four chargers a week. Uh, four four stations a week being um, being put online. So wow. um, you know we have pretty pretty rapid rapid pace going, and and we need wow. that pace uh, to be able to meet our yeah. goal for twenty twenty six. Yeah, fantastic! It's been brilliant. Thank you so much for, for. I'm not. I will now very briefly say that I was late. <laughs> I do this very often on podcasts. You know, it's not. It's happened before. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just want to thank you for your patience and not being cross with me for being a, a little bit tardy when we when we first started. But it's been really fascinating talking to you, Robert. Thank you so much. And well, I'm looking forward to being in California very soon for the the fully charged live show in San Diego. So that's absolutely we're looking forward to it. And thanks for the time. Really, really have fun talking about this stuff. Great stuff. All right, thank you. Really hope you enjoyed that. Very quickly, just want to plug in case you're in the United States, in case you're in the Western United States, in case you're in Mexico, San Diego on the 10th and 11th of September. It's going to be an, that we now know really, really exciting, amazing show. Incredible speakers, incredible amount of stuff on display, test drives, incredible cars there. Every, every, every single electric vehicle that is possible to rent, lease, buy, borrow in the United States is on display there. Really exciting. Please do come along if you can. You'll have a wonderful time. We've done these shows all over the world now. They are always incredibly exciting and successful. I can't wait to go. Um, I wish I could spend longer in California, but I'm actually zooming off immediately afterwards to film some amazing stuff in British Columbia and Canada. So, you know, I'm having a good time, but I would love, like, at my age, it'd be quite nice to have a sit down by the beach, read a book, have a nap. No time for that. Keep going. 
I will, anyway, it's all marvellous. Please do subscribe to this podcast. Please tell your friends about it. That really helps. Let's spread the word. If you want to look at the Patreon link, there is one in the show notes for this. And we'll also put all the links to uh, the, the work of Electrify America into the show notes. But that's it. As always, if you have been, thank you for listening. <laughs>